This podcast is made possible through the support of our awesome THT Plus members. So we have this community of individuals and companies who are passionate about learning and connecting about technology and healthcare. One thing we do for our members is we host a quarterly virtual summit. And earlier this year, we held the Summer Summit and it was a great day, lots of different sessions about all the important topics in healthcare innovation today. This episode of the podcast was the last session of the day at the Summer Summit, so I hope you enjoy it. If you do like the vibe of this one and our summits in general, you've been considering joining as a THT Plus member, there's loads of value. You get to attend the summits every quarter, engage with other members in our community forum, and we do other monthly and regular events for our members as well to help people learn and connect about technology and healthcare. Our autumn summit is coming up on the 10th and 11th of May, so it's not far away. So if you're liking the vibe of this one, consider joining as a THT Plus member, and I'll see you at the autumn summit. So this is the final session of the Talking Health Tech Summer Summit today, and it's one that impacts all of us, whether you're a general practitioner yourself, whether you're creating solutions for GPs or helping them in their business, or even if you're just a human. Chances are you've encountered at some point family medicine or outpatient care, and you're going to rely on the GP system at some point in the future. So this is an important one. Special thanks to Best Practice Software, who are bringing you this session today. They're one of the gold sponsors for the Talking Health Tech Summer Summit, and they're great supporters of THT generally. So please pay them a visit in the expo section of this event platform, and also visit their directory listing over on the Talking Health Tech website to check out some of the other content they've got to share with you there. Okay, so this is your time to shine in the chat. Drop a message, share some thoughts, ideas, frustrations, inspiration, It will absolutely help shape the last conversation of the day here at the summit. So let's hear from you. Here we go. The general practice landscape in Australia is under a lot of pressure and attention at the moment. Something has got to give. What's going to act as the circuit breaker here to put primary care back on the right path? This is session nine of the Talking Health Tech Summer Summit about general practice. On the panel today, Rivka Hagen, business coach, advisor and consultant at Medical Business Services. Tracy Johnson, CEO at Anala Primary Care. Dr. Paresh Dowda, director and principal at Prestantia Health. Moderating the conversation, Chris Mead, CEO and co-founder at Cubico and Halo Connect. In preparation for this session, we ran a flash poll and we asked, what's the one thing that will fix general practice in Australia. One thing, 41% of people said GPs getting paid more will fix it all. 38% of respondents said GPs need more technology and that should fix it. 20% of people said if patients didn't pay for their care, the whole thing would be fixed. 2% of people said it's not broken, so don't fix it. So we've got a problem. I wonder if we can fix it with just one thing or maybe there's more to it. Let's go to the panel and find out. I should add as well that this session is also going to go out on the Talking Health Tech podcast. So we're reaching a lot of people, but if you're here live, get part of it because, you know, we'll, Chris will call you out in the chat and you can, you can Mate, make an appearance. Collaboration, somewhere. collaboration yeah. is what it's all about. Four That's o'clock right. on a Thursday afternoon. You've read uh, the need memo. some brainwaves from the chat. Yeah. Hey, thanks. Uh, thanks for having me on today. And really want to say thanks to Best Practice for supporting this session. Really uh, excited to be representing them today. Um, as mentioned in those beautiful intros, uh, my name is Chris. Um, originally a practice manager, so Pete left that out of the out of the bio, um, and now I uh, work with Halo Connect and Cubico, doing some awesome stuff in general practice. Um, topic today: What will act as a circuit breaker in general practice? I feel like if I had a full head of hair, I could have put my finger in a light switch and just sort of circuit breaked it all out today. Um, it's going to be hopefully a pretty uh, interesting and spicy discussion. Um, some really awesome uh, views on the panel today. We thought we'd quickly go around, people could do a quick intro just to give everyone a bit of a background so you can hear who you're talking from. So I'd love to start with my good friend Rivka. Tell us about Rivka. 
Oh, hi everyone. It's uh, it's really wonderful to be here late this afternoon and uh, thanks to the whole crowd who's attending today for sticking around and uh, joining in today's conversation. So my name is Rifka. I've kind of put that in uh, in, in the little brackets, uh, Rif. This is, you know, kind of the, the easy version of a, a bizarre name. I'm a practice management consultant. My business is medical business services and I provide uh, coaching, support, training and consultancy services to practices all around Australia, a lot of support for PHNs and uh, big and small organisations all around. Primary care is kind of in my blood, so I am extremely passionate about the discussion that we're having today. Thanks, Chris. That's awesome. And um, at the end of the last session, Pete was mentioning in the video some of the amazing uh, podcasts he works on produce. Riv and I do the Medicube podcast. So we do. I've been hanging we do out with Pete, it. making some noise. So we've got some good practice uh, jumping on a panel here. Uh, next up, I'd like to throw to Paresh to tell us about what you get up to. Great. Thanks, Chris. And hi, everyone. Lovely to be here this afternoon. So I'm Paresh. I'm a GP based in Canberra. I spend about half my working week doing clinical work. And that's really uh, a lot of people with complex and chronic conditions. I do a lot of aged care, disability care, palliative care. I know we had a comment about aged care and disability care. Um, the rest of my working week is a whole bunch of stuff, uh, some academic stuff. I've uh, got a couple of academic affiliations with two unis, uh, consultancy work, a um, bit like RIF, um, primary health networks, a lot of work with primary health networks, some work with state and territory governments, um, do a lot of work with New South Wales eHealth and the New South Wales Agency for Clinical Innovation, Models of Care, really anything and everything that's to do with high-performing health systems and high-performing primary care. I describe the golden thread that kind of connects all my interests as being a passion for human-centered care. Mate, well, I don't think I think I don't think we get anyone better to have a chat about the circuit breaker uh, than your fine self. And finally, Tracy, who I'm going to uh, just let everyone know is one of the reasons I, I work in this crazy general practice caper. Tracy recruited me into my first ever general practice job uh, way back a long time ago uh, when I was a youngin. Uh, Trace, tell us about you. Um, so I'm proud to be the CEO of Anala Primary Care. So we're based in Queensland. So unlike Riv and Paresh who are sort of going, oh my goodness, it's the end of the day. I'm just through my two o'clock loop here and I'm just starting to come into the middle of the afternoon. So I've got the group. Um, so I run um, amazing practice here in a disadvantaged location. It's a charitable GP practice with nearly 43 people on our team. Beyond that, I'm a health services researcher. I spend a lot of time connecting with people like Paresh and Riv and others and running seminars as well for practices that wanting to look at the way to do care differently. And that's certainly something that we've pioneered here. I spend a lot of time agitating because I'm an annoying little ant, um, telling people why general practice needs to be core to everybody's agenda. So I'm really pleased that Pete introduced it saying every human needs to understand general practice. And I'm really pleased that at this moment in time, everyone's starting to look at general practice, not as an invisible thing that we just expect to be there, but as the powerhouse of the healthcare system. Um, so I'm really looking forward to this conversation today being about what can we all do to make this a great place to work and a great place to care for patients. Oh, that's awesome. Well, look, uh, and let's chuck, let's get right into it because we thought what better way to kick things off is a bit of a deep dive onto a few chats, get a few opinions out there, hopefully chat, shape the narrative for the afternoon. I do have the chat open on my screen. So if you have questions that you would like me to pass to this amazing panel, please chuck them in there. I will keep track of them, try and find the right moment to, to bring them in. Uh, but first off, Rivka, um, the topic for today is what will act as the circuit breaker to put primary care back on the right path. So back on the right path. Um, what's your perspective on this? Yeah, thanks, Chris. It's, it's, you know, it's the big question you know, right up front and perhaps we need to backtrack a little bit first to say um, the, the circuit breaker to what, where is it that we actually find ourselves in? And, of course, in amongst the panel and, and probably a fair few within the audience, uh, you know, we kind of know what we're talking about here. But just to be really clear, you know, we, we're now facing, um, you know, the decline and the stagnation of Medicare rebates, GPs are agitating 
uh, hugely, including in uh, in the public media, which has rarely happened before to this extent, where you know even the general population is kind of going, "There's something wrong with with general practice. Why can't I get to see my GP? And why am I now having to pay for the care that I've never had to pay for before?" So there are a lot of uh, bits that are or a lot of wheels that are falling off the wagon, uh, I guess. And, um, you know, so I guess, you know, rather than rehashing exactly what that story has led up to, the, the question is, well, you know, what are going to be some of the, uh, the circuit breakers here? And we know that uh, there are going to be announcements coming up. We've been talking about the 10-year plan and the Medicare task force and the release of, um, you know, where funding is going to be spent. We've heard about, you know, the, the government's commitment of, you know, 750000 uh, a big pardon, seven hundred and fifty million dollars uh, yeah. over. Uh, yeah, yeah, we'll just run down for that one. Gross. It oh, feels like seven hundred and fifty thousand. <laughs> it actually feels like that, doesn't it? It really does. Um, you know, and and where that, uh, you know, where that money is going to be spent over the next three years, and the lack of clarity about well, what does any of that mean? Are we talking about? You know, 250 mil in the coming year, where is that going to be spent? And of course, GPs are saying, uh, you need to give more to us, right? Because uh, it's been stagnant and we're not making enough. Give us more money. And, you know, there's this pushback happening, of course, from, uh, you know, from the task force and, and from uh, from the panels to say, well, actually, it's it's more complicated than that. Uh, we, we need to be more creative around that. But in terms of what's that? Uh, what you know? What's that uh, breaker going to be? What what do we need right now in order to move forward? And for me, it seems like we actually need the detail of what's being planned. We've been having this slow burn of release of snippets of information that, in itself, are kind of a bit of nothing. And we're working in a bit of a vacuum we, and we tried to ideate, right? We're all trying to work out what does this mean? <laughs> Are we going to see nurse funding? Are we going to see bigger increases in rebates for longer consultations? Are we going to see changes to the practice incentives program? We, you know, we presume some of these things might be happening, but we just don't know. So for me, the circuit breaker would be give us the detail put the detail around so that as practices we can start planning for what's going to be implemented so that that uncertainty kind of gets a little bit of rest and we can start actively planning and uh, moving forward. Well said, well said. And I think a perfect segue um, through to Tracy. Um, not many people I know have as many connections and, and ears, to the, ears to the ground in Canberra. Sorry if I'm releasing secrets there, Trace. Um, but where do you think it's all going? Uh, what's your, your your inside scoop and and what's your take on all this? I think uh, could get some answers back. So I actually think the the change has happened in a way, and the reason I say that is I equate general practice to being the foot soldier of the healthcare system. You know, we do the majority of the care in the healthcare system in primary care, and yet we take this tiny little proportion, way less than ten percent of the total healthcare budget in this country. And it's a bit like when you think about your feet. You know, we all ignore our feet. You know, only four times a year do I actually get the time to put, you know, some paint on my toenails and make make my feet feel special. But you know what, if you use your feet all the time and you end up with a nasty blister here and a nasty, um, you know, sore foot there and whatever, it actually really becomes a big problem. And for me, what's really exciting is that general practice has finally, in the public mind, and because of that, the political mind, become a big problem. Um, whereas for the last 12 years, we've been part of this really slow bleed where we have just not been funded appropriately. So I think that's number one. Number two. The whole notion of what general practice is, I think, is in for a fundamental change. So a lot of people talk about GPs and they automatically assume that means a doctor. I think the revolution that we're already starting to see and hear from the Minister for Health in the Strengthening Medicare Task Force in the 10-year health reform documents is that it's actually about general practice. And for me, this is a delight beyond anything I could almost have anticipated um, because as an allied health practitioner and a health economist myself, it makes sense to have everyone working to the top of scope of licence. 
having GPs doing what GPs were trained for and what they felt compelled and called to do, having nurses being there, doing what they can do to support patients, having other allied health providers around them. And for the very first time in this country, because there's not enough GPs to do care the way that we've always done it, we're actually being forced to look at what's the new model. The new model must be team-based care. The new model must involve knowing who your patients are, doing all of the right things by that patient over the long term so that we're not constantly building healthcare costs costs and running where the NHS is, um, but we're actually doing preventative comprehensive care, which is really what patients are now starting to say they expect. They want a system that works. Um, and I think the funding models, the change to where things are going are actually now so on the agenda that now it's our time. And you know what? In general practice, to have it as our time is a really exciting place to be. That's amazing. I'm um, Presh, the man bringing all the golden threads together as you've uh, claimed claimed earlier on in your introduction. Uh, Trace PS, a lot of love for your feet in the chat. Um, so I uh, don't know whether that's going to start a podcast. Red toenails this week, people. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, Press, what else are we going to be thinking about, mate? What's, what else is on your radar? Yeah, look, um, I kind of, the, the metaphor I use and think about is, is like, you know, the general practice ship's been sailing for a long time. It's had holes for a long time. What's happened is the water started to fill into the ship and it's now sinking and it's sinking fast. You know, so there's a burning platform, the iceberg's melting, whichever analogy you want to use. Mate, you're very nautical a, today. Uh, I got your uh, icebergs yeah, and that. your ships and your, you yeah. know, I like it. Um, so, so, you know, the, the, this, this real pressure, I guess one of the other things I think about with change, you know, so you look at the last 20 years and people have tinkered with primary health care They've tried to do bits and pieces with it. Most of it being pilots, come and go, nothing really changes, right? Um, so I, there's this kind of three principles. So Pete, Peter Senge you know, created uh, or wrote about 11 laws um, around systems thinking. I've just picked three of those, right? Um, so today's problems come from yesterday's solutions. Okay? By the same token, today's solutions might be tomorrow's problems. So, I think we've got to be really careful with our reform agenda to make sure we don't create problems for the future, number one. Number two, uh, the easy way out leads back in. So if, if we've got a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Um, and what I'm hearing a lot about from diff, you know, diff, different members of the, the sector is, is very much around use more of the hammer, you know, increase the uh, medical item numbers, increase the bulk billing uh, item numbers, et cetera. Um, maybe we need to think about other tools other than the hammer. Um, and then the third principle is faster is slower. So there is a sense of urgency and we've got to do something relatively quick, um, but we've got to be careful that in our temptation to solve a problem, um, we don't slow things down. So they're kind of the three principles that go through my mind. And so what do we need in terms of a circuit breaker? Look, I, I agree with Rip. I think we need to give some respite, some oxygen, and maybe a life jacket. So I'm sticking with my metaphor <laughs> of, of being nautical. Um, but, you know, the big issue at the moment, I think, is practice sustainability. Um, and so maybe we need to inject some practice-level funding as a short-term um, buffer, really. Um, whilst we give ourselves time to think through the more sustainable solutions. I think it's, we've got to be really careful not to rearrange the deck chairs. So I'm, again, sticking with my metaphor today, Chris. Um, <laughs> we don't want to <laughs> rearrange the deck chairs. You know, what we really want to do is create uh, a roadmap of actionable steps that we can take to realize the recommendations that that have been made in, in the Strengthening Medicare Task Force. I think one of the things we're kind of skirting around by talking about bulk billing rates is the big elephant in the room. Like, should primary care be free at the point of delivery? Let's just have an open, honest conversation about that because we keep skirting around bulk billing rates and what they are. Um, and the implication there is there's an expectation that it should be free. But let's just have that conversation and decide once and for all whether it should or not. 
And if it's only for part of the population, let's agree who, rather than have this huge variation where individual GPs and individual practices deter, you know, make their own judgments around who can and can't be built. Um, and then I think let's definitely think more and harder about the technology in its place. Um, it's such a strong enabler. Um, but, you know, for me, I'm a little bit disappointed that our aspiration around the use of technology is, is quite limited. So if you look at the Strengthening Medicare Task Force report, there's a sec whole section in there on modernizing primary care. What it really talks about is the use of information or information flows and data. This stuff could have been done 20 years ago, right? It's like not rocket science or technology to do that. It's 20 years old. We can use AI to create really intelligent insights um, into, our, into our data, interrogate our clinical systems. You know, when I think about technology, technology so goes up exponentially. You know, so um, technology in five years' time will be very different to today's technology. You know, just think back to your mobile phone 10 years ago and how different it is to your mobile phone now, right? Yet, when we think about... I had a BlackBerry. Chris used to pay out on me because I had a BlackBerry <laughs> on the smartphone. Just saying. Yeah. But, you know, when we think about technology and healthcare, like we, we think with today's technology, sometimes we even think with yesterday's technology, right? So we have a very linear perspective around application of technology and healthcare, yet technology is going to go up exponentially. So to me, let's actually think about how we create agility and innovation in primary care through having flexible funding systems, through having the ability for practices to be really innovative in adapting technology and not being restricted by regulatory barriers, financial barriers, et cetera. I'll stop there, Chris. No, no, I think um, I'd love to pick up on a point there. And also um, you, you raised a really good point. And I'd love to get the panel's sort of views on this around uh, practice level funding. Um, but then in our survey, we saw it was basically increased doctor pay. Um, so, you know, at the, and in most general practices, the, the doctor is taking a percentage of the bill, billings, um, but all this innovative health tech, things like that, is being driven at a practice level. Um, love to sort of get people's views on that and how that reconciles out and how it happens in the real world, because it actually seems like a bit of a, a tension point, because you're trying to pay a doctor a service fee and fund a business, and someone's got to innovate and take health tech somewhere. Where does it land? Because I feel then sometimes it ends up in this loop that will build amazing stuff for a practitioner, but a practice has to pay for it or love to get the panel sort of views on that one. I might jump in there um, because I'm in the middle literally of doing some modeling across a whole bunch of practices that have been generous enough to share their data with me because Canberra is actually quite interested. In fact, I think they're terrified. They don't know what the problem is, but, you know, I'm, I'm taking the problem to them and pointing out some of the anomalies that have occurred in thinking. So in Canberra, there tends to be a tendency to think about the money that goes to practices is what we bill money for. So that's what's visible to the government. And they assume that um, it's all working. The reality is we have seen an incremental shift over time about what doctors want to take as a percentage of that revenue. Why? Because in 12 years, the Medicare standard rebate's gone up five times. It is entirely reasonable for doctors to say, actually, I should be being paid more because effectively inflation has halved my real income over that 12-year period. So let's be frank. Doctors should... As general practitioners get paid more, that is why we only have 14% of medical graduates wanting to become a GP, because they can earn way more money in other disciplines that have way less responsibility and stress to be free. Um, so once we get beyond the fact that GPs need to be paid more, let's address the fundamentals of GPs need a practice to operate out of unless they're working in a virtual business model. And I wouldn't want to exclude that from the mix of healthcare provision that we have. So if doctors are taking a bigger split of revenue, you're right. The amount of money that's left for practices to play with when you've got an environment where rents are going up on average 8% over the last 12 months, I've got all of that data out of some big property groups, when you've had award wages going up 6% on average, so again, that's a bigger claw of the money that we've got. I think the conversation that Paresh introduced, what should our healthcare system be? Should it be free at point of access? The reality is if we do the numbers and look at what Canberra is spending in that 750000 it is completely insufficient to give doctors more money, practices more money, and most importantly, within that mix, fund the change that must occur so that we have general practices, not homes for GPs to operate out of. 
And that's really the transition we're talking about, bringing technology in, knowing who our patients are, serving our patients in multiple ways. I don't believe that face-to-face should be the only way that we care for our team. I believe we absolutely, with the shortage of GPs, need to be increasingly reliant on AI, on interoperable systems, on patient-fed data to allow us to manage them comprehensively and extensively. You know, these are all of the things that need to happen, but practices, practice managers, clinical governance, the IT that we use, all of those things need to be massively changed. And the only way to do that is with practices getting bundles of money that they can invest in these things in a programmed intelligent way and a nimble way because we're not going to get it right the first time we're going to have to constantly evolve this which means that people like me people like Riv people like Paresh who own a practice are also going to have to upskill in things beyond clinical in things about IT in things about panel management in things about managing bigger teams in in integrating care with the hospital system with new forms of contracting and funders because you know what I think our healthcare system and what patients are going to demand and what other funders that are out there might demand whether that be insurers or DBA or employers or whatever I think are all going to start coming into the healthcare mix so we we need to stop thinking about general practice just as a Medicare funded system which means we absolutely need to rethink practice management and practice operations. I might um, I might jump in there for a sec, um, Chris, if you don't mind. Um, I uh, actually came across some information just today uh, about the announcement of uh, practice grant funding through PHNs, which apparently is going to be announced in April. Uh, funds up to fifty thousand dollars per practice to support the um, IT infrastructure within practices. And I kind of went, oh, I didn't see that coming. That kind of has come a little bit out of left field for me. Perhaps, you know, others uh, were more clued up about that. And to me, that uh, kind of harks back to uh, the, the early days of the, the e-health uh, practice incentive program structure where there was funding support for uh, hardware, software, you know, the enablement of, um, of the IT services within a practice. So, look, that's, you know, that's good. That's lovely. Again, we have no details of what those grants uh, require of practices. That information will come, but that looks like it is happening at that practice level. I think, uh, you know, the when we sort of talk about uh, interoperability and the exchange of information, we are so far behind the game. You know, we've been tinkering with the My Health Record system now for a number of years, and uh, it, it's it's a very limited functionality uh, tool that is just not anywhere in the modern age, is it? Uh, you know, practitioners are really uh, pretty nonplussed about using it because they just can't really see the benefit of it. It's, uh, it's, it's always old data because it requires the uploading of whatever is in the system right now. There is no sort of, you know, live uh, interaction happening there and there is no sort of collation of information from various sources that provides succinct information at the point of service, whether that is a hospital or a GP practice or an allied health practice or specialist, of what's going on with this patient right now. What is the most current information available so that we are not wasting our resources in finding out information that's actually already known but just simply not available to us. So I do think a big part of this shift and change must come back to the investment in uh, interoperability. And, of course, that also includes interoperability between the the various platforms that practices especially are using to manage their their clinical and their uh, their practice data. You know, the fact that that is, um, you know, not uh, not aligned with each other is, I think, also hugely problematic. And, you know, there there must be incentivization to get standardization happening there as well oh so true so true and i think um you know the fact is data isn't just in practice management systems anymore it's just not in one place we have wearables we have we have data all over the over the shop fresh i'd love to get your um opinion on the role of interoperability as a bit of a circuit breaker based on some of the models you've seen and and some of the awesome work that's been undertaken that you've been part of yeah look chris i i did a um i think it was back in september I actually timed how long it takes me to open up all the different software I use every day and log in, including the two-factor authentication, et cetera, et cetera. And I worked out it's uh, eight minutes a day, um, which when you add it up 
over an uh, over a year, approximates to about ten thousand dollars per practitioner to get op opportunity cost just to log into all the different systems. Totally ridiculous. Um, so yeah, for me, this this uh, just from that one perspective, the need for interoperability is absolutely huge. You know. So we should be able to access all the systems we need to from one login, one interoperable system through some sort of national authentication spine that validates who we are and what we have access to. Um, to, to me, that's just a, a no brain and we need to get there. We can do that in a lot of non-health tech, like, you know, it, it, it's happening. Mate, like, don't say know. the MyGov word. Don't say the MyGov word. No, really. well, I, I, I wasn't. <laughs> I, I wasn't necessarily going to, going to <laughs> public services technology, but you know, there's there's, there's a lot of, lot of technology that allows us to control and share information between different different technologies, different apps, different software products. Um, I agree, health's got to have that extra layer of privacy, uh, uh, and and not to um, under underplay the importance of that. But you know, the the there's a benefits versus harm equation. Like all healthcare mm. comes down to, uh, you know, uh, unintended benefits. Uh, sorry, un unintended harms versus benefits. Right? Uh, in everything we do, that's clinical. To my mind, our lack of interoperability is is actually negligent um, because it's creating a more of a safety risk for our patients than it's it is benefit. So we've got this tension point where we're actually risking harm to our patients by trying to limit interoperability, uh, perhaps you know through through some of the privacy regulations and things. So um, you know, I think it's an ethical dilemma to not do it. And I think that's a really good point. I think it's the first time we've really talked about patients um, and and where that sort of fits into this this equation. idea maybe <laughs> it looks like we've lost uh, Chris somewhere along the line so how about uh, we'll wait for Chris to uh, to to reappear and I'm sure that we can continue our conversation um, with the with the topics that we've got at hand I guess I would say there's been some really interesting comments coming up um, you know on uh, on the chat as well around uh, the views of the, the panelists on uh, you know, uh, companies monopolising access to clinics and shutting the gates to innovation to protect their business model, preventing interoperability and what the views are around uh, that. Uh, look, I'd love to hear what uh, your thoughts are on that, Trace. Look, I actually think that's quite pertinent. The whole, let's, let's not forget that healthcare is inherently political because it's about people's income, their profile, their power. There are certain people that are attracted to profile and power and prestige and there's medical dynasties based on that. Let's be real. Um, I think there's a couple of things that will break through. So if we look at America, they produced some legislation a couple of years ago that said by 2025 it would be absolutely illegal to have any form of software in healthcare that didn't connect with everything else. And if you didn't get it right, you'd go to jail. Well, guess what? It's now 2023 and America's already transitioned. You know, most of their software is talking to each other because nobody really wanted to go to jail um, and not live up to that 2025 deadline. I know that in Canberra there are some people, very earnest and sincere people, who are going, okay, as a software vendor, and, you know, I've been part of the journey around a software company, I understand how expensive it is, but, you know, we we need to encourage software companies to start sharing data. So, you know, a piece of legislation that says to the market, you've actually got to make your stuff work, set your own standards but make it work, I think could be a really powerful game changer and I know Canberra is very actively considering that. I think the other it thing... It makes so much sense, sense, doesn't it, Tracy? that uh, it's the, leg the legislative framework that's going to set the scene for how that behaviour plays out and I don't think um, it would be all that difficult to, to legislate exactly for that. However, of course, companies do need to be paid for, um, you know, for the investment that they need to make in order to be able to comply with that as well. So I don't think, you know, the software companies are, uh, you, you know, are, are to blame for any of that, but they no, do not. need to be supported to be able to to work in that 
way as well. That that but makes that could kind of come in two ways. You know, in the past, government's been very good at handing out money um, to software companies in repeated rounds. Every time the government changed something, money went to the software businesses. Maybe there's a more, more mature or a dual way of looking at that to say, you know, practices are consumers in their own right. How about we fund practice management and practice operations properly and then we as practices actually have more money to spend on this sort of stuff. At the moment, some money goes to PHNs and they give us some software on the side for free and then practices that are doing a decent job or really want to innovate, you know, they'll pay for certain things and then the government does, you know, it's like a real mixed bag. I'm sorry, in the NDIS, in my aged care, all of those things, they've kind of gone, you know, let's give users a choice by giving users control of some of the money. Um, I actually think that a bigger share of that sort of what I'd call soft infrastructure money could come to practices and then we're at the coalface. We understand that transitions of care are terrible in this country. Paresh can quote the data. Um, I've just seen the slides. He's got a bit of memory than me. Um, but, you know, when you look at OECD comparisons, Australia has some of the worst transitions in care of any Western performing healthcare system. This could be sorted out by interoperability. Likewise, in terms of our ability to deliver comprehensive care, let's get the information that patients are collecting all the time and the bloods that they've had somewhere else and whatever and put it all, all on the table so that we can form a comprehensive picture. I think the other thing that will change the game is the move to quality. You know, reinforcing and paying practices to deliver better quality. Does that mean I believe in capitation? No. Does it mean I believe in pay for outcomes? No. I do believe in population management, though. I do believe that we you know, should be stepping up and saying, what do our patients need? And using smart IT and smart health service delivery models and smart tech that patients can have in their own hands to actually do a way better job along that continuum of care of cradle to grave. Whereas at the moment, we have this entirely reactive healthcare system. Reaction is expensive. We all know that having a plan, working your plan, refining your plan, delivering on your plan is what we want to do in our businesses. And yet we work with our patients on this highly reactive basis. And yet the data's there, the systems are there, the technology's there to not have to do that. And on that note, I'm going to hand back to Chris, who... Yeah, I dropped out because of the quality broadband. Show going yes. for you. <laughs> yes, I am uh, in a hotel room in Melbourne and it decided that I should not have broadband today. So apologies for that. But I feel like I ended in a really uh, great point in the debate. Uh, interoperability is definitely a passion of mine and definitely a passion of, of best practice who are supporting this session today. So um, awesome to see that Halo connects out there um, trying to solve some of these problems and there's some other amazing tech solutions that I think uh, Trace and, and Ruby hit the nail on the head that needs a, a, a framework that lets um, individual, let, lets companies be adventurous and try things and solve the problem that maybe bureaucracy won't do. Um, and that's kind of a moment that I get really excited about health tech and, and these sort of forums because it's, they, people have amazing ideas that need a framework for them to flourish in, not a framework where everything dies a creative death because there was no sort of framework for this or it happens and government does this. So really excited to sort of see where that goes over the next few years. Hey, we have four minutes left um, and I feel like it's time to do a bit of a wrap up. And I wanted to go around the panel and say, for the next 12 months, the next 24 months, um, a circuit break is going to have to happen. I think we're all kind of agreed that something has to happen. Um, in 90 seconds or less, because I've done my maths, what is the circuit breaker that you want to you want to uh, you want to see, or you think might surprise us all out of left field, and maybe some clever clever people in the audience should be getting ready for. Uh, Riv, I'll go to you first because you're first on my screen. <laughs> Or, oh, gosh, um, 90 seconds. Uh, look, I'd probably still come back. I mean, you know, we we could probably talk about the issues and the various, um, you know, frameworks for fixing what is a wickedly, wickedly complex problem. We could spend a whole day on that, um, you know, really. So, you know, the 45 minutes yeah. is, is there's not a, There's really an autumn complex. summer coming up. So, Pete, lock it in. Uh, autumn summer. <laughs> That's that's a great idea. Look, I, I probably at this stage would uh, just you know come back to my uh, earlier point that in order for, you know when we consider the the you know the viewpoint of practices and where they're at and the struggles that they're having uh, coming out of COVID and coming out of low funding environments and feeling very vulnerable, very tired and and very tetchy is that uh, you know the clarity around well what actually is going to come next. 
where are those funding dollars going to go? Give us some space to be able to ideate around what the detail of the plan is going to mean for our practices so that we can meaningfully plan and not feel like we are always backtracking and catching up to where the conversation all of a sudden is at. So I truly would love to see just the detail being released and, um, you know, allowing that planning to take place earnestly. That's awesome. And Trace, uh, what about you? I'm going to be super controversial and go, the future is in our own hands. And I work in a social housing suburb. You know, our patients are in the bottom 10% of income earners in the country, but we have moved into mixed billing land. So my recommendation to every practice across the country is that the only thing we can control is the fact that healthcare has a cost. Who pays it is the debate. But the only way to keep pressure on government and to make patients understand that the real cost of care is real is for all of us to keep reflecting the cost of care in the way we bill, both to Medicare and to patients, um, because that will keep the agenda live. The second thing that we need to do is actually clean up our data, because we must move to more team-based care. We must move to more AI-supported care, because there's 30,000 diagnoses that we can't keep in our head, and there's stuff in hospitals and everywhere else that we're supposed to be across. So being able to have records, being able to have um, our own patient group that we care for adequately means we need to clean up our patient databases because we will be expected to deliver more quality. We will be expected to manage panels through some sort of enrolment kind of process. And it's in our own best interest to want to know who our patients are and where they're at because as we start sharing more of this care across the team, everyone needs to know what they're doing. That's awesome. That is a, that is a, a very wise word to think on it. And Paresh, I wanted to finish with you because I feel like you always bring a bit of bit of hope about where it's going. And, and, and from being on the front line, I find that hope inspiring. So mate, uh, how, what do you see uh, coming down the pipeline? Thank, thanks, Chris. Look, I'm going to say I, I agree with Griff and Trace here on most, but I'm going to be a little bit controversial. And I'm going to say, let's pass a law that says that no new hospitals from tomorrow and cancel all new hospital contracts that are in place because that will force a system to think about how it reinvents and does things differently and that difference will be in primary care and general practice and the dollars will flow. Well that's right so you heard it here first cancel all hospitals um, is the takeaway. Um, new new hey, hospitals. New hospitals yeah all hospitals that'll be a bit of a bit of a uh, new hospitals. Um, Put my husband out of a job. He needs to retire anyway. <laughs> hospitals, yeah. Um, I just want to say a huge thank you for giving up your time. Um, well, a lot of thought and, and work went into preparing for today's panel. Um, and uh, hopefully the insights resonated with people and there's a little pearl of wisdom someone takes away and shares with their general practice that they're working with at the moment or sparks an amazing health tech idea uh, that in three years' time we're looking at and having this panel and went, that changed the game. How cool was that? Uh, Pete, I'll hand it back to you. Thanks, mate. Always, always great to have you uh, moderate a panel on a session that I know you're passionate about. Extremely knowledgeable group that we managed to get um, in this today. So thank you, Paresh, Tracy, Riff, and Chris for that. Now, you know, we only had 10% of people who watch the recording in the, in the thing here live contributing to the chat, but then there'll be um, 10 times many more of that, that will check out this session on the podcast in about a month or so. So I encourage anyone that's checking out the recording from this session to get in touch uh, with uh, any of the panelists today to keep that conversation going and keep this agenda front of mind. Thanks again to Best Practice for supporting this session as well. But uh, panel, appreciate it. Thanks for the opportunity. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Thank mate. Great work. Thanks, Thank everyone. You. For more content and community about technology and healthcare, visit talkinghealthtech.com.